uh, let me fix this here. So, you know, I'm on, on campus quite a bit and uh, just to kind of talk, just to kind of give you an overview of what I'm going to cover today is, you know, as John said, I, I really want to just share my personal story. Um, and, and really, you know, that personal story, just talking about my journey from EIU to where I'm at today. Um, I've, been, I've been in this profession for about 30 years, so um, no, I'm not going to go through 30 years of history, but um, as I was preparing for this uh, presentation, I did, it, it gave me a good chance to kind of reflect on um, who I am in the workplace, kind of, you know, some of the key milestones that um, kind of shaped my career and, and kind of how, how that went. So what I want to do is just kind of go through that process a little bit later um, to do that. Um, so I want to provide, you know, as John said, kind of my college background, uh, career path, a uh, little information, kind of get some advertisement uh, about BKD and the accounting profession. I recognize a few accounting uh, majors' uh, names on here and faces, so it uh, looks like we do have some accounting. If you're not an accounting major and undecided, um, hopefully I, I can share some, some information here, and if you're interested, just let me know. Always looking for good accountants from uh, EIU. Uh, then I want to just kind of talk about current trends and disruptions in our industry, kind of what we're seeing right now. And uh, obviously COVID-19, who would have thought that I would be doing a presentation over Zoom a year ago. Uh, so we're all, we're all learning on the fly about this. So we'll, we'll kind of talk about that as far as um, how that's kind of shaped our lives a little bit. Uh, then talk about uh, significant events, again, that shaped my career and kind of how we got there. And, in, and just to kind of wrap it up, just some tips that I've learned or observed throughout my career. And I think, you know, as I go through this, you know, talking about this journey, I just encourage you to maybe write some notes as far as best practices that you, you know, some takeaways. Um, if you're not an accounting major, I think, you know, from a finance for marketing, or management major, I think there's, there's some information that, that you can take away. Because um, I, I really tried to design this for um, just a, what, what a graduate is thinking right now or a, a soon to be graduate, uh, you know, as far as going into the workplace. I know that can be daunting and uh, the, the world we're living in now is probably even complicated that e even more so. So where did I go to college actually? I went to college at EIU. Uh, graduated in uh, 1987. So I would consider myself a prototypical EIU student. And, you know, we do a lot of recruit, we've done a lot of recruiting at Eastern over the years. And I think the culture of Eastern really hasn't changed since I was in school in the late 80s. Um, you know, what I, what I view Eastern as is, you know, and I, there's, there's a lot of students from the Chicago area, but we have also have a lot from the central Illinois area and downstate Illinois. And, uh, you know, I think the, the, tr the, the traits that we see when we're recruiting students, and I think this was kind of the traits I had is, you know, a lot of, a lot of the students are from smaller towns, uh, went to smaller schools, and uh, they chose Eastern because of the uh, uh, intimate setting and access to the professors. Uh, and, and that hasn't changed over the years. Um, I also see uh, an EIU student as having a strong work ethic. Um, when we're going and interviewing students, it, it's, it's pretty incredible to look at the resumes and just looking at some of the work experiences that the Eastern student has, uh, you know, worked on a farm or an athlete or, or paying, their way, paying their way through school. So, I, I think that's something we really like to see in our, in our new hires is just having a strong work ethic. And I think uh, the background of the, the student at Eastern uh, provides that. Um, also, I think a lot of the students, you know, just due to being from a smaller town, I think it's, it's a pretty laid back um, uh, personalities there. And, and that, that's what I had. So just kind of going back and reflecting back in the late 80s, what, what I really looked at, you know, the profile that I had is, you know, I was probably a very average student. Um, you know, at the time, I didn't have a lot of self-confidence. And, uh, but I think over the years, and as I talk about the journey, I, I just want to kind of talk about how that confidence really, 
you know, uh, how it progressed uh, throughout my career. Because I, I can honestly say the person I am today is probably not the same person that I was at Eastern, but the foundation is still there. And I think uh, you'll, you'll see that there. Um, what did I study in, in school? Um, you know, being a, a, an average student, uh, probably a B student, uh, had a few C's on my resume, believe it or not. Um, you know, I, I, at the time, I, I thought, you know, I, I've really got, you know, I have an accounting degree, but is this really what I want to do? And I remember uh, my junior year in college, um, I was going through and just really, I was in a fraternity. I lived in a fraternity house th this year, and it was the, the first semester. For, for all you accounting majors, you can appreciate this. It was my junior year when we were really starting to get uh, the the real core classes there and getting overloaded with that. And it's very overwhelming. But at the time, you know, at the end of that semester, I was really questioning if, if accounting was really what I wanted to do. And uh, I, I went in and talked to a professor who was uh, a new professor at that time. And he's still, he's a professor over at Indiana State now, but you know, just kind of talked to him saying, you know, I really want to switch out of accounting and maybe go into management. And he, and he just really talked me through the process and said, you know, do you really want to do that? Um, if you go into management, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, uh, you can always go into accounting and then go into management later. So he, he really talked me out of that. And I, I can really appreciate that today because it, it provided me some insight. And I think that is the value. Another value that Eastern provides is just having that one-on-one -on -one experience with your professors. And I know it's still, still alive today and probably even more so. So, you know, being a very average student, I thought, you know, if I have an accounting degree, maybe I need to uh, get a resume, start thinking about my resume and building that up a little bit better. So I did decide, you know, I had a few, uh, at the time it's called computer management, and I got a, a double majored with computer management and stayed an extra, um, a sem extra semester. And I think having that double major with computer management at the time, back in the late 80s, um, really was a little more attractive whenever I was out looking for, for a job. So, so I graduated in August of 1987. And, uh, you know, a, a further background, uh, being in the business world, uh, neither of my parents were really in the business world. My dad was a, a principal and an educator all his life. And my mom was uh, in the nursing field, was uh, an anesthetist. So really, I didn't know a lot about the business world and really learned about it from my friends. So didn't have a lot of guidance at home as far as, you know, what the business world looked like and how to look for jobs. So really didn't think about that until uh, my, the, the, spring, uh, the spring semester um, of my last year and also the summer. And so at the time, the, the job market in the late 80s um, really wasn't a strong market. So my thought process is I'm just going to go out and get a job, you know, find, find a job. And uh, an opportunity did present itself right when I graduated in the summer uh, with a firm called, uh, it was a printing company called More Business Forms. And More Business Forms had, uh, they were a pretty big printing company before we had, before the, the computer industry really um, came into vogue and uh, did a lot of uh, forms uh, for businesses. Uh, Sears was probably one of their biggest customers and it was a national uh, manufacturing company of printing forms. And so uh, having a plant in Charleston, uh, I think probably led to an opportunity. There was a plant in Rochester, Indiana. And uh, so I interviewed with that and uh, it went really well. And so my first job was in private accounting uh, with more business forms in Rochester, Indiana. And uh, I will tell you at the time I did not, Rochester, Indiana is in the uh, uh, northern part of Indiana. I did not know anybody in that community. So uh, being a very introverted person and uh, uh, not really being exposed to the world, I think that really, uh, uh, opened some eyes to me and it really gave me a chance to grow up and I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But while I was there, um, I, I was in Rochester, Indiana for about two years and, uh, you know, for all the non-accounting majors, I think really, um, just, to, just to let you know, I think one of the things we want to do is get our CPA designation. I think that's very important in our profession. So 
while I was there, not knowing anybody, um, I just sat, I, I studied for the exam, uh, and it took me about six months. It was all in one setting at that time. Now it's, you take it in parts. And so I just, not knowing anybody, I just invested that time into passing the exam. And I, I told you, you know, just to kind of backtrack, I did re remind you there, I told you I was a very average student at school. And the pass rate on the CPAs, uh, the CPA is, uh, is very, it's less than 50%. And just due to the, 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 the work ethic that I had and the, um, the attention that I put into and the time that I, that I devoted to study for the exam, I passed it the first time. So, you know, while I was doing that after passing the first time, I said, you know, if I'm going to go into public accounting, now's the time to do it because uh, typically public accounting is not for somebody that's been out of school for five to 10 years. It's really a, uh, the environment is really for somebody that wants to travel a lot and uh, is pretty adaptable there. So, an opportunity arose. Uh, I told him my dad was a principal and one of his students, one of their parents was a partner in a, a firm called KPMG, which is a big firm right now. And we had, a, there was an office in Decatur, Illinois. So I had a chance to, uh, you know, I think that was very attractive to me. I had a chance to move back home. You know, I had a chance two years to kind of grow up and, and really kind of find myself and who I was a little bit and pass the exam. So, you know, that two years was a, a very, a very good time for that. And uh, so at that time, again, uh, KPMG was, it's a national firm and uh, had, a, had a good opportunity there. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more of how that evolved, how KPMG, be, our office became BKD here in a few minutes. And so that it kind of takes me into just talking about BKD and kind of give, plugging the firm a little bit, just to let you know um, you know, what, what we do, kind of what our client base looks like, and, and a little bit of background there. Um, BKD is a larger a, a regional accounting and consulting firm. Uh, we have 40 offices in 18 states. And uh, actually those states, we're out in Utah all the way to New York City now. Um, probably five to 10 years ago, we were primarily in the Midwest. So we've had a lot of expansion and a lot of growth. Um, so, so just to backtrack a little bit, you know, I talked about our office being KPMG. So back in the late 80s, Indicator, we were uh, KPMG. Uh, and in about 1991, um, KPMG was starting to get out of the smaller markets. So um, our local partners ended up buying our office from KPMG and affiliated with a firm out of Indianapolis called George S. Olive. And uh, George S. Olive was just out of Indiana and Illinois. We were their first office in Illinois. So I went from a large, you know, working for a large CPA firm, a multinational firm, to a very small firm. And so we were Olive um, through the 90s. And then in 2001, George S. Olive merged with a firm called Baird, Kurtz & Dobson out of Springfield, Missouri. And at that time, uh, through that merger, um, basically we had offices in Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Arkansas, Missouri, primarily were the, were the main states. At that time we had $70 million, $70 million in, in total revenues. And really the, the reason for the merger was to get into the Chicago market. Both, both uh, firms wanted to get into the Chicago market and having this Illinois office they thought would be a, a good opportunity there. So that was back in 2001. And since 2001, um, we've grown our revenues from 70 million to 700 million now. And it's been a slow, it's been a very methodical um, increase in revenue through the expansion. And, you know, through the years, even though I've worked in the same office, I've had to adapt to going from a large firm to a smaller firm and now back to a large firm. So it's almost become full circle as far as how we operate. So, you know, they always talk about how careers or how life always comes full circle. And I have experienced that. Hopefully I'm not at the end of my career. That doesn't mean that I'm at the end of my career. So it, it's been a fun ride to see the growth of our firm. Um, we now have 2,900 total employees with the firm and have 300 partners. So um, I am, a firm, I am a, an audit partner with the firm. 
and I specialize in, in financial institutions. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about our firm, uh, firm culture, um, we're a very conservative firm. Uh, you know, we think things through, we just don't make rash business decisions, but we think through it methodically and uh, being a partner, um, I can appreciate that, you know, just having those quality controls uh, in place there to protect, uh, protect our interests there. Um, the other thing we have, which, you know, a lot of people talk about values. Um, you know, that's always the buzzword in business. What, what's the values? And I can honestly say we have um, the values are called pride. Pride stands for passion, respect, integrity, discipline, and excellence. And I can honestly say we live those values. We have a book that kind of goes through and talks about what does, you know, because our and we don't sell, we don't sell widgets, we sell time. And so how does delivering a service in Decatur, Illinois, how do we make that consistent with somebody delivering that in New York City, Chicago, Springfield, Missouri, Salt Lake City, Utah? So, you know, we, the firm has developed a book back in the early 2000s talking about what the values are, what, what the expectations of what our client service is going to look like. So we're in the fourth edition. We've developed a book that, that, that memorializes that. And, uh, you know, when we talk about our values, it's, it's, in, it's incorporated into our training. It's incorporated into our um, mentoring process with our, um, in all of our employees. Um, it, it's, it's, it's factored into when we go through and evaluate our services to our clients and how we evaluate our performance, um, we get evaluated on that. So, I can honestly say we, we truly uh, abide by that. And, you know, I think most people can, can recite that. And I, I think a lot, of, a lot of companies say they have these values, but it's a lot, I would say probably 50 or 60% of it is, you know, it's, it's the, the sexy thing to say at the time. And, uh, and I think we, we really um, uh, live that. As far as BKD and how does that, you know, if you have an interest in BKD, uh, just to let you know of, you know, kind of where we've recruited uh, people out of from Eastern, where they've ended up. Um, primarily, I would say the office probably of interest of the Eastern campus would be our Decatur office, which is probably the biggest focus we have, the firm has at Eastern. Um, we also have an office in Chicago, St. Louis, and Indianapolis. So those are probably the four uh, offices that most of our most of the EIU students would have an interest. Um, I know during the career fair we had somebody that was interested in Salt Lake City, so we have a variety there. Um, specifically in our Decatur office, we have about 30 professionals here, and so whenever I go through and recruit, I always tell our our candidates that I think it's the best of both worlds because our office being a small office, I can say we have a small office environment. However, we have access to to, a, to large firm resources. And uh, also our client base, even though we're in a smaller office, I can honest, I would put our Decatur clients, um, the size of our Decatur clients up against, you know, our Chicago office or our St. Louis office, and we would compete well. We have SEC registrants. Uh, we've, our office has taken probably, since I've been there, I, I've, I've been uh, on four or five engagements where we've taken uh, some of our banking cup, banking uh, uh, clients public. So I've had a chance to work with the SEC, um, you know, going through the IPO process for that. So, you know, they're smaller companies. Um, and I think the, the beauty of that is uh, working with the middle market clients, working with smaller uh, banking clients or the middle market clients, um, you have a chance to really work closely with decision makers. Um, those decision makers, you know, we have access to the board of directors, the CEOs, the CFOs. So to me, that's been very interesting because, you know, with our client base, I, I deal with probably uh, 20 different clients uh, that I, I'm responsible for. And it, it's really fascinating to look at the different management styles, what's successful, what's not successful. So, um, you know, I think that's ex the exciting part about public accounting is, um, we have a chance to deal with clients. Uh, you know, your first four or five years, you're probably more, doing more audit tax, doing more of the compliance stuff. But as you 
uh, as you're able to understand the industry you're working in or the profession that we have, um, you become more of a consultant as time moves on. So developing the, that skill set has evolved over time. Um, as I said, um, I, I specialize in financial institutions, so I'm in the banking world right now. Um, you know, it, when I first started, it was, you know, working with audit programs and really just, you know, tying out accounts and doing more compliance. But now some of the roles I do, it, it's more, you know, strategic thinking. Uh, you know, I facilitate strategic planning sessions. I help with mergers and acquisitions. And so really the skill set before was I needed to have the accounting knowledge. Now the skill set, I mean, the, the accounting knowledge is the foundation. However, now I have to understand how to be a strategic thinker. And that doesn't happen overnight. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time. It took me probably 15 to 20 years just of, you know, it, it, was, it was an evolution. And uh, just working with the various uh, mentors that I had. Um, it, it took time. It doesn't happen overnight. So I think the first takeaway I have here right now is when you start your career, be patient um, and, and just absorb everything that's coming out at you. You're not going to know everything when you first start um, and, and just be willing to listen and, and, uh, and go through that. So that's just going to evolve over time. You know, today I, I'm learning every day. There's always something new that I'm learning. And that's, that's the exciting pot, exciting thing about um, the, the work world there is just the challenges that are thrown at you on a daily basis, hourly basis, minute basis there. Um, it, it's very fun. And to me, whenever I, whenever I leave work, the difference between a boring day and an exciting day is probably a new challenge that I've encountered out there. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than being stale in your career. And I think you really have to go and look for those opportunities or look for those, um, those challenges out there. I think that's very important. Um, so just kind of back on, you know, my role right now, big picture thinking, uh, strategic planning, mergers and acquisitions, and working on SEC registrants. Um, so that's a little bit about my advertisement for BKD. And if anybody, you know, wants to learn more, um, you know, we're on campus quite a bit. And with my involvement on the advisory board, if you're an accounting major, uh, we've probably had some interactions with that. As far as trends and disruptions in our industry, um, you know, in the accounting world, um, it, it's interesting to just think about my first day of work versus where we're at today. And I can honestly say the my my first year I worked on a, a local, it, it was the, the local county audit. And I literally, um, on day one of that job, I, I had an adding machine, which we really, that's pretty much archaic now. We use computers. Um, but I had an adding machine and they had a general ledger that was a manu manual gener general ledger. And it was a card system with a stack, probably about that big. And my job for two weeks is to sit in that adding machine and just add up the, the debits and the credits for you accounting majors to make sure they balanced using an adding machine tape. That was two weeks just going through that. So I learned how to use what we call the adding machine. We call it a 10 key because they have 10 keys. So I learned how to do that kind of how you did with typing just with that exercise. Now today, that same general ledger, um, now what we do is we just get a computer file, we download it, and what I did in two weeks takes probably 10 minutes. So technology has definitely changed our profession. Um, you know, it's disrupted the tax preparation process, um, H&R Block, uh, TurboTax, um, they've disrupted our, um, probably the, the, the 1040 practice for tax returns. Um, our firm, uh, we don't do it as much in personal tax returns anymore. It's probably more of the complex, the corporate tax returns, the partnerships that have more complex that be, where you really need to think through some issues and again, do a lot, of, a lot of consulting work there. So definitely from a disruption standpoint, trends, um, we've really had to think about, you know, the tax standpoint. We have a lot of, you know, now if you bring your W-2s in, we can scan it in and it automatically populates into the, 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 the tax return. So 
the skill set of a tax preparer now is totally different. Um, really now, um, just due to that technology, before, you know, a new hire would be responsible for the input and maybe the first review. Well, now that we have that process automated, it's probably the skill set is really, you really need to be, have uh, better analytical skills. And so I think the challenge we're having as a firm is how do we train our new hires? Because before the training was the input and, you know, people learning that process. Well, that step's been taken out. So how do we uh, give our new hires meaningful projects that are going to enable them to learn. And, and so I think over the next three or four years, it'll be interesting to see how we evolve. And, and, and I'm confident we will. Um, from the audit standpoint, um, it is starting to become automated. Um, you know, I, I talked about mergers and acquisitions, or if we have a client with a lease, usually with, with mergers and acquisitions and leases, they, they would have contracts, you know, it's a contractual, uh, obligation that you entered into. So some of the procedures we used to do with that is we'd have to read the contracts and determine um, the accounting uh, ramifications as we read through those contracts. Well, now we can scan those agreements into, um, in, into a, uh, uh, some software and there's artificial intelligence out there that we've developed that will go through and read those contracts and spit out the key elements there. So Again, it's kind of saved time. So it's gonna be interesting to see how we automate our audit process. Um, you know, being a large regional firm uh, during the early 2000s when we had some major accounting scandals, uh, our firm was a beneficiary, beneficiary of, uh, there was a lot of work that was needed out there and the big four in, in an accounting world, the big four or the four major accounting firms out there that do all the Fortune 500 companies. Well, they were walking away from larger clients. They were small to them, but they were large for us. And uh, we were the recipient of that. And it really, when I talked about growth, that's where our firm really grew because the big four just you know, walked away from that space. Well, now due to technology, and uh, the, the merger wave of, of, of all the corporations, the big four are starting now, they're starting to automate their audit process. So now they can come back to that, that space and do those audits more efficiently. And, and now they, they're, they're attractive to them. So that's something that is probably a threat to a lot of our client base. So for a firm our size, um, we're investing time. Um, the AICPA is our trade organization. So we have a project, we're working with the AICPA for the audit of the future. So that is something as a firm, we feel that you know, we could potentially get disrupted out there. So we need to stay ahead of the technology curve. So I think you know, if you're in the business world, you're seeing a lot of the mergers and acquisitions where the big just get bigger. And that's gonna be the same in the accounting world. It's the same in the banking world that I work with. We're all experiencing that. And I think our firm is really well positioned um, with that, just with our size. Um, we're not the big four, but we're not a smaller organization. So, you know, I think our niche is probably, you know, when we go out and market ourselves to potential clients uh, and prospects, we basically say that, you know, the advantage that we have over the big four is you're going to have more partner involvement. You're going to, you know, we're, you're going to be working with us uh, more closely there. Um, so we have those resources. I think from a smaller firm that, you know, probably you're familiar with in the local towns that do both audit and tax, um, they have some challenges ahead of them and we're seeing consolidation because of the investment, investments they're going to have to make with technology. So, you know, I think technology in our industry, just like any other industry, is definitely uh, disrupting that. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, that I talked about was consolidation. And I think as, a, as, as an employee, consolidation is very important. And I'm going to talk about that here in a second. Um, you never can, you know, probably when I first started, you could get comfortable with where you worked at. You saw a lot of people that worked in that industry or that company their whole life. Um, nowadays, with consolidation um, in, in the changing landscape, you've got to be adaptable. And fortunately, in my standpoint, I've been you know, blessed to work with a firm and 
you know, we, we've been growing. So I've been, been on that side and have not had to, you know, we've had some firm name changes. We've had consolidations, but luckily there was no overlap there. So I was very fortunate in that regard. However, I'm not naive to think you still have to really have to sharpen your skill set, keep your skill set sharpened at all times because you just never know. Even though, you know, you see a future with where you're at, something can happen overnight, whether it's a, you know, a consolidation or your company gets sold and you need to, you need to continue to, to build that resume, refine that resume. I think that's very important. Uh, the other thing that I think is disrupting our profession and uh, the business world and basically the United States and the world itself is the baby boomer retirement. Um, you know, we've got a lot of what I would call brain drain, um, you know, in our profession and it's, it's everywhere. And so, you know, there's a lot, a lot of opportunities for somebody right now that wants to get in some leadership positions because that baby boomer generation I think we probably have till 2025 till the last uh, part of the baby boomer generation probably retires at 65 to 70 years old. So we're probably starting to get on the tail end of that retirement. So what does that mean? You know, not only are, are we needing more work, younger work paper, work, workers out there to replace that and also, you know, to, to, to replace those leaders. Really what, what it's meant is it has been a change in how we do business. Because the, um, the baby, as you're aware, the different generations have different values, have different skill sets and, and different, you know, baby boomers, you know, their motto was you work hard, um, you know, work was, was always primary. So as I was going through the ranks, you know, it, it, the, the motto was um, you, you got to be a loyal person, you got to work hard, you got to earn your dues. That's not really true anymore. Um, you know, I think we're seeing a disruption on that. Um, you know, I look at our firm, a very conservative firm, um, three, two years ago, we could not wear blue jeans at all. We were in a suit and tie. Well, now, you know, we've changed our dress attire, um, because of, you know, just trying to appeal to the, the younger worker out there. So, um, the dynamics are changing in how we view business and, you know, I have to find myself, you know, I was, I was raised by baby boomers and I was on the tail end. I was probably, I mean, I'm close to being a gen or a, I'm trying to think of the, the, what right before the, right after the, the baby boomers, I, I probably am have a mentality of a baby boomer. And, and I thought that way all the way through, through my career. However, the, probably the last five years I've learned we have to adapt um, because we're getting, you know, 30, 35 years old, 35 year old people in leadership positions, and they view the workplace differently. So we have to, we have to be adaptable, we have to be flexible. Um, the other thing is just looking at um, flexibility with work arrangements. Um, before, you know, you, you got your work done while you're in the office. And I think the baby boomers have been, uh, it's kind of put them on their heads trying to allow people to leave the office at four o'clock. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I think, you know, the, the younger generation, they may want to leave the, the workplace at four o'clock, but they're willing to go work, you know, at night at 10 or until one in the morning. So, you know, I think we've really changed our views on, you know, what does work mean? You know, how, you know, what does that work, work life look like? It, it's different for, for a, you know, a 25 to 30 year old as compared to probably somebody at 60 years, years old. So that has definitely changed over the, the life of uh, my career there. And then the last item I was just going to talk about on disruption is COVID-19. Um, who knows how that's going to change? I mean, we're, you know, I, I'm, I, I get fascinated by reading trends and I think that's, that's really helped me in, in my business is just thinking about trends. And, uh, you know, I, it's fascinating to hear demographers talk about the different generations. Because, you know, if you, if you think about it, you know, the generations are the ones making this, these decisions. And that, that's what influences, um, it influences politics, it influences the workplace. So having a good handle on why are we having these trends, you know, why, you really what you have to do is study generations and how 
how these generations have been raised and, and the values they have. And that's going to project out a trend for the next 10 to 20 years. So just kind of think about that and kind of be aware of that as you're reading, you know, kind of doing your, your reading out there. Just kind of look, think about trying to, you know, an over, overblown phrase is kind of the Wayne Gretzky phrase is to uh, know where the puck's going and be there before the puck gets there. And I think really in the business world, that's really about trends. And if you can really have a good handle on trends and kind of see how things are going and, and get ahead, I think that's really going to help you um, as you're going through there. And so what does that have to do with COVID? Well, think about COVID now and just think about how things are getting disrupted. You know, I look about and when we get on the backside of this curve, how is that going to affect how we deal with clients? Typically right now we're out dealing, you know, we, our clients expect us to be out at their location on a daily basis. But since March, we've been working remotely and with our technology, we haven't, we've been dealing with clients through emails, through the internet, through the phone. And uh, I, I think they realize that this can work. So there's still a human element that we have to, to have there with the interaction. So I don't think we'll be at our clients on a daily basis, but I think there's going to be a good mix there. Um, you know, just think about shopping habits, thinking about the malls, thinking about travel, thinking about the big city versus the, the you know, going, you know, the, the trends in the big cities that we saw in the last 10 years. It used to be suburbia probably 20 years ago. So everything just cycles back and forth and just think about the derivatives of all that. So I think that's just something to think about is your, you know, in my work, you know, in accounting, I think about it. And if you're in marketing, you're going to think about it in management, et cetera. So I, I think that's important, important there. Um, so just kind of talking about that, that's really talking about probably the um, more global picture of the, the macro picture of, uh, of the firm, kind of how I got there, or just, you know, the, the, the basics there from a macro picture. Now what I want to do is shift a little bit and just talk about there's probably about six, six or seven items that I feel when I look back and when I prepared for this that I feel have really shaped the person I am at work, the person I am at home. And, uh, you know, I, and I think these were, these were big changes that really kind of the aha moments, I think, that really helped me um, grow as a person and uh, go through the career. And the first one I'd mentioned before, it was really living in a community where I did not know anyone. And, you know, why is that? You know, I, that was only two years, but that's right whenever I graduated from school. Um, I really, it, it gave me an opportunity to learn about life. Um, it, it really forced me to meet new people. Um, it got me out of my comfort zone. And I'm going to talk about comfort zone as I go through here, because if you're always comfortable doing what you're doing, you're not improving your life. You're not improving your life. You're not improving your skill set. So just kind of think about, just kind of take a, a pick, kind of think about some, an instance maybe where you've done something and you went in and you said, no, I don't want to do it because you're out of your comfort zone, but you, you went, ended up doing it and you were successful at it. And just think of, just reflect about, how that really changed you as a person. And so I guess my point here is, is if you're never out of your comfort zone, uh, you're not gonna go anywhere in life. So challenge yourself and, and really try to do something that, that is out of your comfort zone. You're not gonna like it at first, but I'll guarantee you if you're, a, if you're an athlete and you've run and you know, you know what that endorphin high is, I think this is very equivalent to an endorphin high is when you get out of your comfort zone and you have to do it. Think about that first speech that you had to do. And you know, it was, it was very nerve wracking at first, but think about at the end, you were done with it. But just think about how much you learned from that. And so we, we, we're always getting out of our comfort zone. I still, you know, on a daily basis, you know, there's or not a daily basis, but there's several times within the last year I've been out of my comfort zone and, and to me, that's the indicator that I'm doing something new and, and I'm growing as a person. I'm growing, uh, growing with my career. So that, that really definitely, that's probably the first thing that got me out of my comfort zone because I had to learn how to, how to live on my own and, and kind of go through that. Um, the second item was just passing the CPA exam. And, uh, 
you know, and I think the main element there, what that did for me is that really, when I talk about confidence, that really, um, that was the first, um, I was an athlete in high school and, and did pretty good with that um, and had confidence with that. But just personally, you know, confidence in myself. I mean, I, I, you know, just passing the exam, knowing that I struggled in school on tests, um, what that told me is I can do it. I had the foundation there and uh, that just added the confidence. Um, also, as I mentioned before, it really opened doors for opportunities, just having that designation. So, you know, whether you're in accounting, whether you're in uh, finance or marketing, I think uh, the other t takeaway here is um, not only pushing yourself there, but just getting all the credentials you can, because I think, you know, especially in this world, I talked about not being in the same company all the time, just having designations, having that expertise will open up doors later on and having, um, you know, certificates, I think is very important there. Uh, another item was teach, uh, I had to teach, uh, it was a Becker CPA review course, probably four years into my career in the mid nineties. Um, so I had been with the firm three or four years and really what that forced me to do is getting up on my feet, teaching people. Um, again, it was another self-confidence standpoint because I really had to know the information. I was an instructor and I was, I was, I was in Champaign with U of I, you know, a lot with U of I students. So it was a very intimidating thing, but it really taught me the accounting world. And, and I can honestly say when I came back and worked, it made me a better accountant and auditor because I really knew the material there. So that, that was very important. Uh, the other item that happened before that was having a family. I think that is very important. Um, just, uh, you know, your family, your significant others, um, having that support staff. Um, you learn a lot. Um, they're there to help you through the process. And I can't preach enough about work-life balance. Um, you know, in our career, uh, it's very demanding, but I can honestly say that I was there for my family, for the important events, for my kids going through school. Um, so I think that's very important is um, having those, those good family values and having a good partner that understands uh, the importance of what you're doing and vice versa there. Uh, the next item I think is, is very, was very important to me. I had a mentor that looked out for my best interests. Um, there are a lot of times uh, this person, she was a baby boomer. Um, she was a very, she was a tough nut. And uh, there are times that I, I literally cussed at, you know, cussed at her in front of her face because, you know, she wrote bad comments about some of the work, but she was there to help me. So, you know, I respected her. Um, she was very well respected in the industry I serve. Um, she was smart and uh, she had my back and she was the person, she was my advocate and she got me to partner. I mean, she, she helped me go through there. So, you know, now I think it's pay it forward. You know, somebody did that for me. I think that's important. And I want, you know, people for work that work for me, um, I want, I want to, I want to give back on that because I couldn't have done it without um, that mentorship. So I think the, the mentoring is very important there. Uh, the next item that was very influential for my career was being the office recruiter. Um, again, got me out of my comfort zone back in uh, early 2000s. Um, managing partner said, hey, we need a recruiter out of Decatur. Do you want to do it? And I was like, no, 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 I can't do it. Um, but I ended up doing it. And what it really forced me to do was to develop relationships with professors, with career fair people, and just in connecting with students. And uh, it, it's been very, very gratifying. And what's been even more gratifying is one of the people I just hired, or I, first hires I had from EIU uh, made partner two years ago. So partner process is about 15 years. And it was, it was very rewarding to know that, you know, we hired, you know, I, was able, I had some input in that person and, they, and he's very influential within the firm now. So that's very gratifying and really neat to see. An EIU student, um, that was a success story. That was a success story because I can, I always like sharing the story about it. he's in our, Dow, our Houston office now, but uh, he came in, for, he missed the office interview because he overslept. And so, you know, I think most people probably sit and automatically nix that, you know, nix that. But he called me up and said, hey, Craig, I understand you, you may not want to have me in, but I just want to let you know that I overslept. I understand. 
um, but I'd still like to come in and interview. And he ended up coming in an interview. And I thought, you know, if this guy has the guts to tell me that, um, you know, it's really all about character and just looking at character there. So I thought that was pretty important there. So I don't do all the office recruiting now. I help with it. And it's still neat to have interaction with students and doing what I'm doing today. Uh, and then the last item I had as far as my image is just being a famous person in the industry you serve. Um, you know, I'm in the banking industry, so I think it's important you do speaking engagements. I facilitate CEO forums, strategic planning, and I think that's very important. So those were some of the monuments when I talk about the, the road from EIU to where I'm at today. Those are really the key, um, key items that really shaped my career and, and, and continue to evolve there. So the last section, I know I'm getting close here. Um, you know, John said, tips learned from the school of hard knocks. And so just to kind of bring this all together, I think I've really covered a lot of this. And so just to kind of bring it together, I think the first item is become involved. Um, become involved with your company, become involved with your community, um, be a famous person, make a difference. Um, just don't come into work to put in eight to five, make a difference. And, you know, I think what that's going to do, it's going to make you really like what you're doing and appreciate what you're doing. So I think you really have to, to go through that. Um, the next item is network. I can't emphasize this enough. Um, um, networking, when I, when I go back and reflect on the networking process, um, you're networking right now in school. Um, I've had a lot of, um, just through college, I've had a lot of doors open just because of our connections with Eastern. Um, I did not, I, there are a lot of people I didn't know at Eastern that I've met in the business world today. We have that common denominator now. And so it's opened a lot of doors. So, you know, continue to network with your, your, your peers right now at school because they're going to become influential someday or they're going to have some opportun opportunities or have something you need. And I think it, it's, it's interesting to see you'll see those, in unex they'll, they'll pop up in unexpected places. So I think that's important. Network within your company. Um, building uh, uh, sales skills, I think is very important. Even though, you know, people think of accountants as not salespeople, but I always tell people we're always selling ourselves. Um, so you're always, you're gonna just learn those, those, those selling skills. I think that's very important. And the other thing while you're networking, identify the top performers wherever you're working at. Study their traits. What are the good traits? What are the bad traits? I talked about my mentor. She had some bad traits, um, you know, and, and I'd make sure that, you know, I knew how I was treated with that. I've adapted a little, you know, I respected what she did, but I, I adapted a little bit because it was a little overboard there. So, just study traits of people and why, you know, from your standpoint, why are they, why are they successful? Kind of, you know, do some read, you know, just read and read about successful people. There's a lot of books out there. I think that's very important. Um, and, and get to know, get to know those high performers, seek them out. Um, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're your potential sponsor, like my mentor, she was very influential. So, you know, identify who those, those influencer are, influencers are and develop, you know, what we would call a personal board of directors. I think that's important there. Um, take pride in your work. Um, I talked about the eight to five and always learning. I think that's, I can't emphasize that enough is, you know, when we have new people come in and they just do it just, just because it's a job, we can see that. So always take pride in your work. Um, work smart. Um, you know, a lot of people may put a lot of time in, but it may not be productive. There's a way to be productive if, if you're working smart. Learn how to delegate. Learn how to identify what's important, what's not important, and focus on the important stuff. I think that's very, very important. Um, accept change. Um, as I talked about uh, now more than ever, you have to be versatile. Um, you have to continuously reinvent yourself. Um, you know, with technology the way it is today, um, I've had, you know, it's, even though I had a computer management degree, learning, you know, the new software out there, you're, we're always learning something new. So always be open to reinventing yourself. And I, and I think that'll help. Um, set goals. Uh, setting goals is very important. I don't see that as much now. Um, I, 
where I get frustrated with our profession, and you know, typically our profession, it churns over a little bit because of the demand in it. And people come into knowing that because you, you learn a lot, you learn at a fast pace. But I don't think, I don't see people thinking about what their sh short term, mid term, and long term goals are. I can honestly say when I came in the workforce, I probably didn't, I didn't come in saying I was going to be a partner, but I knew what, what I wanted to do to get to the next level. So you have to know what, you have to know what you want to be able to study to get there. So I think uh, knowing what your short term goals are, think ahead again, think about trends, think about where things are moving and develop your skill set to, to do that. I think it's going to help you plan. It's going to help you, uh, align with the right people that are going to help you get those goals there. Don't, you know, you're not going at, at this alone. You're, you're, you're going as a team. You'll have a, a team uh, to help you get through this process and, you know, through life. And I've talked about a lot of those team members and, you know, and again, just establish a framework for the long-term goals. You're likely the long-term goals have, they're going to change, but if you have a framework to get there, it allows you to change. And I think the last thing that I, that I really want to emphasize, and I've talked about it a lot, is really getting out of that comfort zone. I think that is, you know, being aware of that. Um, uh, as I talked about all the milestones I had, they were all uncomfortable moments, but you really achieve a lot. And I think if you talk, uh, talk to high achievers, they're going to talk about that comfort zone and getting out of, you know, getting out of the, the comfort zone. So, you know, just looking back, it's, it's been, you know, 30 years in this career. Um, it's been a fun ride and I continue to expect to have a lot, of, lot, lot more fun years ahead of us. So with that, if there's any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about the firm or kind of what you're experiencing or the industry or whatever, or just open it up there. So now's your chance. If you have a question for Craig, please unmute yourself and ask him, or you can type it into the chat bar. Craig, I've heard TED Talks that weren't this good. I don't know about that. This was, this was fantastic. I'll give everybody a couple of seconds. Get your thoughts together. If you don't have any questions, I do have a couple, Craig. Okay. One of them is, you talked about the values of BKD. How important is it when you're talking to students for either internships or full-time positions to be aware of the pride values that you have and then maybe to demonstrate them during the interview? Yeah, you know, going through the interview process, uh, you know, a lot of people, a, a good interviewee will look at the, um, look at your website and they'll ask the basic questions. They'll, they'll talk about the pride values and they'll, they'll spurt it out talking about, yeah, I saw on your website that you had the pride values. Um, and every, everybody does that. Um, so I think really what sets somebody apart is they may not explicitly say they saw on the website, but they may through the interview process weave that in through discussions. Um, and so that it's not obvious, but you know, when we're having these interactions, they've, you know, you can tell if somebody's looked at it and observant. I want somebody that is going to see those pride values and maybe go an extra step and how not tell me that they saw the pride values, but just maybe subtly bring that up in a certain experience that they've had. So not only the values, but whenever you're researching a company, try, you know, Talk, if you know people that work at those places or look at the industry, kind of think about, do your research out there and just don't, you know, do the basic stuff. Again, whenever I talked about invest, I think there, there's a way to invest yourself into the interview there to, to sell yourself and to convince that person that, hey, this person really took an interest in, in this interview and, and really took and understood it and wove that in. And as you're going through the, 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 the interviewing process and the give and take, you know, the, the, you know, you may have brought something up earlier in the conversation, maybe later on, somebody follows up and said, Hey, I heard you say this, this, and then kind of weaving that in so that we know you're listening and paying attention rather than just having your five questions that you want to ask. I think that's very important there. That's great. Thank you. So, um, I, I hope it's Steven, it could be Stefan. 
um, he, it's, this is long, and I'm going to read it to you verbatim, Craig. Okay. Um, he apologizes for not using his camera mic, but he's in a noisy and distracting environment, so I appreciate That's that fine. thoughtfulness. I was checking out your website, and it looks nice. I especially like the page on pride in the award recipients. I mm -hmm. send it to my team, suggesting we do something like that for our annual Excellence Award recognition. I imagine the pride traits are also what you look for when partnering with others. I'm not an accountant and have no desire to be one, and many would be glad for that as it's not my area of strength. However, in the past, as a marketing consultant, I found partnering with accountants was a great way to add value to each other's businesses and clients by sharing our expertise with each other's audiences. I've transitioned my career the past decade to focus on human performance improvement, hence being back in grad school, but can see where the partnering match could still be mutually beneficial and add value to clients. Finding like-minded people who serve the same market, but with complementary services has been great to increase reach and edify both partners while helping the clients learn and grow by, by. For example, holding a webinar for clients on a topic from the partner's area of expertise. Like you said, being a famous person or expert in the industry or market you serve and expand your network. Have you done things like that before? If so, what kinds of partners have you had? Would you be interested in doing something like that if the fit was right? Absolutely. Um, you know, in our business, you know, myself and the financial services business, um, when I talk about networking, um, you have to think about the, the we talk about influencers in, in the network. So like in the financial services industry, they're the, but you, you need to know who the consultants are, who are these CEOs, who are they talking with? So in our industry, it's uh, attorneys. There's a lot of bank attorneys that they specialize in banking. So um, you know, what we try to do is, is, well, a good idea is with the, the CARES Act. You, you've probably heard about the CARES Act um, that we just had. Um, there's a lot of legal stuff in there, a lot of compliance. So we partner up uh, all the time with outside people. Um, it's, it's interesting when, when you, that, with a question on the pride, I wanna, I wanna address that pride values because I, I didn't talk about this, but we do, we have the pride award winners every year at our annual um, leadership group, which is our partners, managers, et cetera. And, the firm, what we do is we honor two people. We honor a partner who gets a pride value award and also an, an employee. So that could be a support staff, that could be a, an associate, that could be a staff. And we actually um, bring those recipients along with their family to this leadership conference, which is 1,500 people, to talk about the pride values. And they have a video and they, they always, our CEO will go to the office and they surprise the, the recipient of the award. And it's, it's breathtaking to watch the video and whenever they present that. And then they have the recipients give up and talk about why, you know, talk about, talk about the Pride Award and, you know, what, you know, how they were nominated. And they're all very humble. They're like, I didn't expect this. I didn't deserve this. And it, it's interesting to see our people that have only been with the firm, maybe are, uh, managers that are like seven year people that get up and talk. It's like very impressive. And it's um, just listening to them talk about their experience and how they deal with work, how they deal with, you know, everything. It's, it's very moving. And uh, every, it's every year you get, you're just like, this can't get any better. And it does. And it's just to hear those, the, those stories is just gratifying there. But yeah, to, to go back to the question, I mean, if there's value to the client, um, you know, leveraging relationships is very important. And, uh, you know, in the accounting world, um, we all look the same on paper. So it's really about the, the human element that is the different differentiator and how you, again, we don't have widgets. It's, it's personalities that we're selling. I think that's very important. Thanks, Greg. So I, I want to respect your time, Craig, because I know yes. you've done this as, as a favor and because you want to give back to Eastern and 
provide some information for the students, and I do appreciate that. Um, I, my, my final question, I don't see anything else in the chat. So my final question is, I know that you said you don't do a lot of recruiting anymore. Um, I want to tell a quick story, and then I want to ask you a question. When I first got into this position and was working to set up, um, to, to connect with people for the job fair, you were the single person who wanted to meet in person rather than just have a phone call. And to me, that said, uh, that said a lot. Um, I realize that some people can't do that because they're a further distance away, but you made it a point to meet with me in person rather than just agreeing to have a phone call with me. And that really made it, that made it had an impact on me. So again, I have heard TED Talks that weren't this good. You can discount that if you like, but it's true. Um, my final question is, I know you don't do a lot of recruiting anymore. If one of these students wants to connect with someone at BKD, should they, um, they can contact me and I can put them in touch. Would you like for me to connect them with you or with Jocelyn? Yeah, um, you know, the way, the way we structure this now is the partners, um, J Jocelyn Dennis is our recruiter out of our St. Louis office. And so what we've done is we've assigned um, partners or managing directors to the, the schools we recruit. And since I'm an EIU graduate, I'm on the advisory board. Um, I've been the go-to person and, and Jocelyn handles all the interviews and that. So come to, you can come to me first. If, if you have, if you know, if you've met Jocelyn, um, she can handle it too. But again, it's, we'll, we'll be the funnel of what we can get there. So. Okay. Thank you. And Appreciate again, it. Ileana has a question for you. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so first I want to say thank you very much for uh, your presentation. It, it uh, spoke to me more, not like a presentation, but like a personal experience shared with uh, um, all the, the attendees. Um, so it was very, uh, if that doesn't sound too bad for you, very low key, very personal uh, connection. Uh, thank you for that, because uh, there's a lot of um, people here that have many questions about their future. Uh, EIU is a great place to be, but um, we have to be at one point out. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned um, your experience with uh, your um not sponsor but how did you call her mentor mentor yes um uh, so i'm well aware that uh, your mentor not necessarily must to be older than you but rather more experience in the field you want to go to um and i've been thinking about to tap in, in, in these opportunities. And I know fully well uh, yeah, you uh, offer such a service, uh, if you can call this thing service. Uh, the, there is something uh, that stays in a way, let's say put that this way, stays in a way in front of me, uh, is how do you do that? So one of the, the options is uh, just put my name there and ask somebody to pair me with somebody I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I have to, um, let's say, get out of my comfort zone and decide to trust this other person's opinion for our compatibility and that this will end up uh, in benefit for both of us. Yeah. The other thing is to approach somebody I have deep, deep respect and do it by myself. Uh, but what well, this is, so how how do I go to somebody and say, hey, do you want to be my mentor? It sounds very awkward, at least to say. And um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how this approach going to be taken from this other person. 
uh, I mean, like I come from totally different world in time and space, and I don't know how this thing work. So basically, let's say if I approach you and say, hey, do you know, I think you're a very cool man. I think you have an awesome career. I think you have a lot um, uh, for me to learn from your experience. Can, but it, it will sound, sound like, can you be my mama? You know, uh, it, it's, it's awkward. It's awkward. So my question is basically, how did you, how did you in your personal experience uh, make this thing happen in your life, this woman to be your mentor? Yeah. You know, I guess just to answer your, to answer your question, um, I think first of all, being a, if you're looking at a, being a college student and having that mentorship, um, I know in the accounting uh, school through the advisory board, um, we've been working on uh, the mentoring, mentoring program and, it, and that's been in the works for probably five or six years and it's always difficult because of getting people connected. And so, you know, really for a mentor to really work is you really have to know, you really have to know each other. I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's a relationship. And the reason why the, the mentorship, you know, the mentor, the mentor that I had did not happen overnight. It probably took two to three years of working with each other and taking a step back and sizing each other up and knowing what ticks and, how I benefited that person, how they, you know, and vice versa. It's like, it's a win-win for both, both situations. And, you know, so just to go back to your question, my mentor, she was 10, I think she was 10 years older than me and obviously probably had about 10 years of experience on me. So to me for a mentorship to really work is you have to, well, it, it's a relationship. And I think the challenge we have with students and professionals is, um, you don't have that relationship when you meet, you, you just don't come up and say, Hey, well, I mean, you can, but for it to work, you, you have to know somebody. And I think if we have some students on here that are early, early in their careers, I would encourage them to get involved with the, the student organizations that have um, interactions with advisory boards, such as what we have with the accounting. I think the business school does too. And uh, I've gotten to know, and I've met you, Eliana, through uh, the career fair. I've met you through Accounting Day. Um, we've interviewed. Um, so, you know, and I know on Accounting Day, they had a freshman on there moderating the, one of the panels. And I'll guarantee you, all the advisory boards are going to know this person because you just get comfortable and you start learning about each other. It's, it's a human element. That's why I brought up um, when you get into the workforce, be observant of who those successful people are. And uh, you're not just gonna go up and say, you'll go introduce yourself and, and you know, again, it goes back to relationship. It's not gonna happen overnight, but if, you're, if you know who those people are and understand how they operate, you're, you can make that connection, but you just have to be smart about it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but I think. Okay that's a challenge we have with, you know, with, with the student part there. It's, it's, it's relationships. It is. It is. You need to build some certain level of trust uh, to each other. Yep. Eliana, thanks for asking. Craig, I'm going to bring this to a close so we can respect your, your time and you can go home to your family. I want to tell you that we've been very honored to have you speak tonight. I and I really it. appreciate it. I'm going to speak for all the students that were here. For the students that joined, I want to thank you again for coming to this. Without your attendance, we won't be able to continue these. Craig wouldn't come back and speak to just me by myself and give me all this <laughs> wisdom that he's got. So thanks for attending. I appreciate that. Craig, I, I am in your debt, and I really appreciate you coming. Uh, no, it's no problem. I enjoy doing this stuff. And it's fun. Great. So Thanks before you go, everybody unmute yourselves. Let's give Craig a golf clap and send him on his way. Thanks, Thank you. Craig.
Thanks, Thank Greg. You. Have a great Thanks. night, everyone. You too. You Bye. Too. Thanks. Thank you, John, for moderating all this nicely. You're welcome, Ileana. Have a good evening, everyone.